This video is a recording um, that focuses on hierarchical uh, cluster analysis, and it will be an SPSS um, overview in terms of the input um, uh, and output uh, expectations when you run um, SPSS hierarchical uh, um, cluster analysis. So um, when you go to uh, analyze, then classify, then hierarchical cluster. We want to uh, open up the dialog box and specify the um, inputs that we'll want to use to run this analysis. Um, now remember, hierarchical um, analysis uses a step-by-step um, approach to entering the uh, data. In this particular data set, we have um, countries. And for a number of countries, um, I think there are 120 or 121 or so different countries. And then for each country, there are a whole bunch of human statistics available. So uh, we see these statistics here that deal with like life expectancy and uh, infant mortality and birth rates. And um, there's some technology ones here, radios and phones per 100 people, um, hospital beds, uh, doctors per thousand or 10,000 and so on. So um, what I did here was I just brought over um, four different variables. Um, that I wanted to um, see if we could create some clusters associated with uh, these variables. So um, simply bring those over um, under the label by case or label cases by. We have our countries um, that are in a uh, nominal variable. So this is the list of countries that are available in the data set. So I have the, those labels. I want to cluster by cases. Now it is possible actually to cluster by variables. Um, so we'd have variables that would be grouped together. Mm, this is a little different though. It'd be a little bit like a factor analysis if we did that, um, but uh, that's not what we're doing. We're, we're analyzing cases here. And then we want to also display statistics and plots. So those are the main uh, screen or uh, main dialog box uh, items to worry about. We'll also look at these other items over here, statistics, plots, methods, and the save option. So moving forward to those, um, as we look forward uh, or look, look ahead, um, this box here, this this box over here is actually should should be um, the uh, the this um, method area um, uh, in terms of what we're going to be able to get, or maybe it's the statistics area. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but you're going to pull up this box here where you're again with with hierarchical regression, you have a lot more um, ability to choose um, cluster method and then also distance method. So um, remember there's um, the furthest and closest neighbor. Um, there are the group average options. There's the wards technique or method. Those are all options here. This centroid clustering is one of the options that's available to you. So you want to think about changing those up and attempting different 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 options um, as, as needed. Some options are better than others, so you just have to try them out and do a little bit more investigating to see what works to create the best clusters for you. As does the measure, uh, whether it be Euclidean, squared Euclidean, or or so forth. Um, there's five or six different varieties of distances optioned there. Finally, in this one box, um, remember we want to standardize our data. Um, so we want to have a standardization process here. Um, and there, uh, again, with the drop down box, we have options here. Then we're standardizing by variable. Um, so we have that to do there. Um, one of our plots, so this would be the statistics, and now we would this should actually be pointed towards the plots. Um, the den dendrogram is helpful. Um, now we have a lot of um, 
a lot of cases. So 121 is a lot of cases to be able to visualize in a dendrogram. Um, but we're going to do that. The icicle plot is another option here, and you can click that if you want. Icicle plots tend to be difficult to interpret, so um, they might not be very helpful. It may not be very helpful uh, moving forward, so uh, just use that with caution, although it doesn't cost anything to uh, click on it and try it and see. I have none selected but uh, you can play around with that. The other sec other um, drop boxes here under method and save, um, th th this, this is going to give us um, um, two things we want to look at. Number one, the agglomeration schedule again can be helpful if you want to interpret it. It will give you the step-by-step -step process that was used to group the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the cases together um, and to help form the actual um, the, the uh, clusters. Um, the, the agglomeration schedule though is largely repeated in the dendrogram um, graph. So if you have both of those, you'll be sufficiently covered to be able to investigate. Um, otherwise, otherwise, um, we'll just have to um, otherwise use the dendrogram for, for that. Proximity matrix may also be helpful if you want to copy, paste, and then maybe use it in a graphing program of some type. I don't have it checked here. It can be otherwise fairly unruly to try to try to understand. Um, other things that you want to look at, range of solutions. Now, with this, you can specify a single solution or you can specify a range of solutions. Um, the, the idea here is that we're exploring and we don't know how many clusters we would expect to see. So you can have a range. I have between two and four. So this is going to give me two, three, and four uh, different cluster uh, allowances. Um, the other thing is we can save and create new variables. And again, we could save these um, if we want to here as well. This is going to create three new variables, two, three, and four cluster assignments. Um, and we'll be able to look at those a little closer here, here in a little bit. Um, once we click OK, we start to get some of our, um, some of our data. Um, in output form. So remember we have the agglomeration schedule. Now this agglomeration schedule is not specifically for the data that we uh, that we have. This one here is and I have appropriately said yike uh, this is huge. Now it's so big and long because we have a step Virt for virtually every single um, case that we have available. So obviously this is too small to read and it would give us all a headache if we tried to analyze it in a lot of depth. Um, the one thing that is here, the coefficient is here, and then every single step where we combine um, uh, cases into clusters and then recombine them over and over and over and over again just the way it's outlined here. So remember we had in this agglomeration schedule we have um, we have item uh, or observation 11 and 12 that were put together because they were closest together based on our distance score that was used to form this agglomeration and then this cluster reappeared in step number seven in step number seven, um, it shows up here as an 11, but but case eight was added to it to to build a bigger to build a bigger cluster, and that sort of happens in an iterative way where clusters are built over and over and over again um, through each step. So again, this is the one from our analysis, but it is crazy long, and we're not going to like go into huge detail here examining it, but just know that it's there. If you do want to, one thing that you can do, and um, SPSS will do it um, or, or may be able to do it for you. I've seen it done before. This coefficient column here, you can actually take it and um, highlight it, 
click it and create a graph and it will actually create something that looks a little bit like a scree plot where it starts like that and then it starts to go up up like that and you you look for these large gaps where there's a blip in the in the data um, and those blips or those large jumps if you will and i didn't draw it very well here but there'll be large jumps kind of like a scree plot in reverse where there's the large gaps indicates where a cluster may form so that's actually kind of the numerics behind that um, uh, and and it kind of helps helps you identify you know where where and how many clusters might actually emerge um, moving forward okay so looking at this data a little bit further the next table that you're going to see is going to be a cluster membership table and again this table is really long because it has every single um, uh, observation listed so I don't have it the whole thing listed here what I did was I just took a sampling of our observations and basically um, I guess what I did when I did this analysis is I did five clusters so I did two through five um, and you know and and basically what happens here is if we had two clusters only two clusters then these countries would be in the in one group and then Argentina Bulgaria and Hungary would be in a second group so cluster two if we had three clusters then this column would be our cluster assignments if we had four then this one would be and so on and so forth so this gives us our actual case assignments if we were to choose two three four and in this case actually five clusters and so you can see depending on our cluster number each country will be um, assigned accordingly and in the appropriate in the appropriate one um, so we can uh, if you remember earlier we had the option to save these so we'll actually see um, you can actually go back into your data now and there'll be new columns that were created in your data set for these um, assignments um, of of the uh, observations into the appropriate clusters whether you have a two three four and in this case a five case solution so that's actually really important this is a really important key thing to be able to do because um, we will eventually want to examine the differences between say groups in cluster one versus cluster two um, and we want to note how these clusters behave differently on the key characteristics and traits that we're that we have that we have for our observations uh, so that is an important um, uh, table to, to remember the dendrogram for this um, particular um, data set uh, again uh, this this had a I, I asked for a two to four solution but the dendrogram is going to uh, reflect um, again um, the data that that we that we saw earlier um, and and um, it'll actually it'll actually be a reflection of um, of of the table that we that we had before um, but interestingly here um, what we're basically looking at is we're looking at a group of countries here that are similar and then we have a group of countries here that are similar they're not really the same as the first group but they're the second group but they're close and then we have a third group and then we have a fourth group and if we took these four together and bring them up to this level then we have a cluster and then we have a cluster here and then we have a cluster here so it looks as though there's a big gap um, that's formed here um, between these these clustering these clustering levels and so if I was interpreting this I'd probably say a three cluster solution is probably appropriate for this data if we went down a level then we'd have a group here a group here and oh, who knows how many groups would be here it would kind of blow up a little bit um, if we did a two cluster solution then we'd have all of these countries 
and then just these countries. So it seems like a three cluster solution is pretty reasonable to suggest here, um, just looking at the way these group together. Um, now, also, uh, just know in your data output, this um, table will be um, vertical. I flipped it over horizontally just so that we could see it on this slide. Um, the last thing that we'll point out is that when we look at these long stretches per country, this is where we have potential outliers. So this would be like a longer string or a longer, longer. So, so these countries took longer to be assigned into a cluster. They weren't clustered right away. It took them several iterations, but, you know, probably two or three or four iterations before they were ever found a home, where they found a home. This one here is another indication. So that one is actually, I think, Rwanda. And then we have Egypt here and Albania maybe. I think that's what that says. I can't really read it. We have two others over here, which also, this one in particular, seems to be a bit of an outcast, Italy, or just in terms of being unusually listed or, or weighted here. So this could be an outlier too. So we actually have probably four, may, maybe the UK, maybe this one here as well. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know, maybe, the, maybe North Korea. North Korea is up here. North Korea may be an, a, a, an outlier, um, maybe based on, and you know, think about North Korea. We may not have valid information on that particular country. We don't know. That may be causing it to be a bit of an outlier too. So, it's, so, so anyways, maybe Italy, maybe, um, maybe Egypt, and if that's Albania, maybe them, um, maybe Rwanda. Those are ones that we could think of as potential outliers. And remember, outliers will skew the data. So if you take any of these out, take one out at a time and rerun the data to see, to see how it all, all shakes out. Okay, so that's how we wanna examine this. And now this helps us better understand how we can move forward with an analysis. So right now we don't, um, we, we have um, group membership. If it, we, we can go back and we can look at group membership for a three factor solution. But what we can also do is we can use this information now and run a K-means cluster analysis um, to help verify and validate some of our some of our conclusions, we could also run a, a two-stage or a two-step um, analysis as well. That could be something that we we end up end up running um, and uh, and specify specifically the number of steps. Uh, a number of clusters as three. So if we do run the k-means um, analysis, then this will be basically the output. Um, and so we have an iteration history, which converges after five iterations and everything uh, gets down to the zero point here um, in, in terms of how much change happens with the cluster center, like where the centers are located for each cluster. We have our final cluster uh, centers from the, uh, here, from the initial to the final. Now, please note, I standardized these variables. I standardized these variables because the variables were not from the same scale. So I standardized the variables before running them. So these may seem like they're odd in a sense, but they're standardized. So that's because that's something that will impact the results greatly. Um, according to our ANOVAs, we have significant relationships or significant findings for all four of our variables. Um, so they all play a role in contributing to group membership. And then finally, we have a case analysis based on how many countries fall into each of the three cases. And there are actually nine here that we don't have sufficient data on. There's missing data on nine of the countries. So we could deal with that another way or with, with some type of uh, data replacement or imputation. Um, but otherwise, 
28, 39, and 46 is a good group membership size. It's not, of course, perfectly even, but it is fairly reasonable uh, in terms of numbers to be able to compare groups now um, and do some ANOVAs that, and do some profiling and creating cluster, uh, or country profiles based upon their cluster membership that each, each country is in. So um, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, that's, that's the process. I mean, that's how it's done. And um, that's what we would do to move forward. Um, it, there's, there's not a significant number of um, statistics to report here. There's certainly the, cl the final cluster centers, um, cluster membership. And, and basically now what we want to do is we want to take our cluster membership and then start analyzing clusters based on the variables, other variables that we have that we're interested in. Um, and, and again, like in segmentation, we would create market segments probably, um, but that's the process and that's, that's basically where we are. Um, have any questions, uh, please, uh, the best thing to do is to just to take some data and explore and have fun with it and try this technique out.